Okay, so that was No Reply, and it's uh, the bridge or midsection of the album, which critic Ian McDonald called the, uh, this part of the song among, quote, among the most exciting 30 seconds of all the Beatles recordings. All and of them. Go ahead. All of them? Of all their recordings, he called this among <laughs> among the most thirty among the most exciting thirty seconds of all. Well, their and I know if there's one person who knows about ex- exciting thirty seconds, it's you, Matt. Well, <laughs> I credit Mr. McDonald to this, and I didn't I didn't uh, think about that till he said it, and then I was like, yeah, that's a really good part. So um, so anyway, this is this album it ranks number eighty on our list. Um, actually, it's the best ever albums. We keep calling it our list, but the list by that we that we are going by. Um, it was ranked number five in 1964, the year that it was released, and it is 781 of all time. It is the Beatles' fourth studio album, and it was the, their fourth album that was released in the span of 21 months. So this goes back to what we were talking about, about just how it was very normal for a number of artists in the 60s to just pump out albums, you know, one after the other. So the Beatles were certainly a part of that. Um, So it was recorded between August and October of 1964, really between their tours. So they were very, very busy. This was basically the height of Beatlemania. And they, you know, started recording after a a, a world tour that included uh, stops in Europe, Australia and Asia. So they did a little bit of recording in that summer. And then they took a month off to record or, or to tour in the U.S. for about a month. So um, and then they came back and finished in the fall of 1964. So um, it's a departure of their upbeat tone of their previous albums. So we're starting to see a little bit of a darker side to the Beatles, as dark as I guess as they as they would get. Um, And this is attributed to a lot of um, influences that they were that they had at the time, most notably um, with the influence of Bob Dylan, who they were very big fans of. And they were actually able to meet in August of that year. And so Dylan was a fan of the Beatles, but he famously, you know, told John Lennon, you know, you, you, you guys do great music, but you're not really, what are you saying? You know, he's kind of challenging them a little bit on their lyrics. So, um, and also they were very in, in, much influenced by country music, which they were hearing a lot, listening to a lot of while they were in the U.S. touring. Ringo was also a big fan of country and Western music. And so there is, and it's interesting because I've known this album for many, many years, and I never thought of this as a country album. But I but here and mostly that's because you don't really hear the traditional country instruments. Right. So there's no slide guitar or banjo or anything like that here. It's, it's, it's pretty much straight up, you know, pop uh, you know, music instruments. But after reading about that, I could see where that's coming from. And I can talk a little bit about that more later. But with a lot of country and Western music, it's kind of sad. It's a little melancholy. And, you know, with those two influences, they were, um, you know, trying to go for a little bit more introspective. Uh, lyrics with their music as opposed to just the, the all the happy stuff that they were doing before for the most part. Um, so this was a time period, like I said, it was the height of Beatlemania and the band was exhausted, becoming exhausted with all the touring and the, and, and just everything that they were involved with. So, um, it, but they, the, but they felt like they still needed to pump out the, um, the hits and they were also feeling a little pressure from the record company to just keep working. So this album that they wanted to, you know, the, the album before this Hard Day's Night was actually an entire, there were no covers on that album. And, but this album, they were, they just said, you know, we need to, we, we don't have enough material essentially to cover a full album. So um, it's, they, they went back to, you know, including a number of, of covers. So this album has eight uh, original compositions, all credited to Lennon and McCartney and six covers. They also recorded um, I Feel Fine and She's a Woman during these sessions, which were not, which was I Feel Fine was released as a single. And that that is also the song that has been attributed by many people as the first track with um, feedback ever on a recording as they discovered that in the studio. So um, the even the album cover, it's, it's kind of funny. I read about this, that the album cover even reflects their weariness, because if you look at the cover, they're just <laughs> they're just staring kind of blankly into the camera. They have straight faces and they just kind of look exhausted. Um, and the album title Beatles for Sale reflects the commercial value of the band at the time, because they were basically, you know, there was all about selling stuff, you know, um, you know, records, uh, merchandise, tour, you know, tickets, all things like that. Um, so this was a time where they started Right. You know, they started um, Lennon McCartney anyway, stopped writing together, uh, you know, and, and started 
working more independently. So, you know, one of them would start a song, write a good portion of it, and then bring it to the other who would kind of contribute a little bit to it. So you started seeing that a little bit here. Um, but the album was released with great success. It was remained in the top, th top three of the um, UK charts for five months. Um, and, uh, and interestingly enough, it was not released in the United States until 1987 um, because this was released, uh, the number of the songs were, were either released on one of two albums in the US. One was Beatles 65, and the remaining songs were released on Beatles 6. So they were kind of, it's almost like doing like the Led Zeppelin thing because um, they just released albums differently in the US um, than they did in the UK. So or the Scott Walker thing, Matt. Or the Scott yeah. Walker thing. That's true. <laughs> and I, I didn't know about the Scott Walker thing until a couple weeks ago. So that's a little history of it. Um, it's kind of an interesting time period for the band. But um, I've got a number of notes on all the different songs that we can talk about. But, you know, as, as far as impressions go, let's start off with uh, John. What did you, I know you're familiar with this. So sure. um, what was your uh, overall impression? Let me give you the, the boilerplate hot take. When people have asked me my least favorite Beatles album for as long as I've listened to the Beatles, this has always been my answer. So I was interested to listen to this again to see if I still agreed with that statement. You know, sometimes you say something for so long that you wonder if it's still the case and you don't want it to become a cliche because you've been saying it for so long. Uh, while I did enjoy this album and eight days a week is one of my favorite Beatles songs ever, probably top five. Ironically enough, I feel fine would probably also be in the top 10 since that didn't make the album that probably would have greatly helped. But yeah. I, I, this does, this sounds like a band that was in between two worlds. It was not as fun and poppy and effortlessly catchy as the early albums, like with the Beatles and, you know, meet the Beatles, hard day's night. And it didn't lead to that mid-career Beatles that I really enjoy probably the most of the Beatles. Help, Rubber Soul, Revolver, they're not quite there yet. So while this is a necessary album, I think I still stick by the fact that this is probably my least favorite Beatles album. But, you know, bad, bad, uh, Beatles albums are like pizza and sex, right? Even like, you know, bad is still good, right? So that's kind of my general takeaway on the Beatles and, and on Beatles for Sale. Right on. Josh, what about you? Yeah, I agree. It's clear that the touring affected them on this album because I feel like this is a weak effort also. Um, I have similar thoughts from the last album, actually, too. I mean, coming off a, coming off Hard Day's Night, you know, having all original material and then going back to covers, and I, and I feel like these covers were actually, you know, weaker than the, the covers from the last album that we talked about. Um, and I feel like they should have just put out an EP or something of, cause the front, the front, uh, you know, couple songs are really good. The ending is a uh, couple songs are good and eight days a week is fantastic. But, um, all the other middle is and the covers specifically are just like, I could, I could leave it. So, I um, mean, it is rare. You see a Beatles album where I can't list more than three songs as being excellent. And on this one, I would probably say there's two very good songs and then one pretty strong song. And then the rest are decent, but not mm -hmm. great, you know? And that's, I think, the best way to describe this album is it, it's, I don't want to say a money grab because, you know, the record, you got to do what the record company says, right? But you, could, you can tell, and you can also tell, I think, a little bit that Lennon and McCartney are diverging at this point. Uh, because the songs that each of the, I know that they're credited to Lennon and McCartney, but this is the first album where you really see what I consider to be Lennon songs and McCartney songs. Like, for example, I'm a Loser is definitely a Lennon song, you know, like without a doubt. Um, mm -hmm. And I think, you know, that becomes even more pronounced. I think it's Help is the album after this, correct, Matt? Yes. Yep. yep. And, and that's, I think, where you really start to see the Beatles in terms of, I think, what people think of as the Beatles with you know, a group, but also Lennon compositions and McCartney compositions and then the occasional Harrison, you know, composition and, and they're sung, but they even sing their own stuff as opposed to covers and maybe even singing the stuff the other people write. So I think this is the beginning of that, but to me help is really where they become the band that they're going to be. 
Yeah, and then rubber soles after that, right? It is. Yep. Yep. Yeah. So, yeah, that's man, harsh, harsh criticism here. I, I, I can't say that this is on the top of my list. This is probably on the bottom of my, of my list of, of Beatles albums. I would place this ahead of the last one that we did, um, which was uh, with the Beatles. Not sure if I would put this ahead of their first album, Please Please Me. I, I you know, it's kind of it's kind of in that you know the bottom tier. Um, definitely for me, but I, I, I really like this album. Um, it's, I, I, I'm not getting the, you know, the lack of catchiness. Um, I, I think it's, I think all of these songs are catchy. Um, I, I can see it's definitely a darker tone. I mean, you start right off with I'm a loser, babies in black. Uh, I'm sorry. Um, no reply. I'm a loser and babies in black, which are all, you know, their songs before this was, were all very much about love. And, you know, I'm, in, I'm infatuated with this girl and I'm going to take you out and, all these sound, I'm going to show you how much I love you. And then this is like, Hey, you know, no reply. You're basically ghosting me. Right. You're not, you know, I'm a loser is I can't, you know, it, it's really the beginning. It's, it's help before there was help. You know, it's John Lennon, you know, sc- you know starting to scream out, you know, I'm not, you, things aren't as good as you think that they are. Um, well, and I'm putting and, on this mask. And no know. reply sounds like it should be on help. Just like, um, I would say that, um, uh, rock and roll music, right. feels like it should be on an earlier. Beatles album because it's a great cover but it very mm-hmm. much feels like it should be on with the Beatles right um, mm-hmm. and and that's how I feel like a lot of this is it, it feels it feels like a singles album at times where stuff should be placed on other more fully uh, fully formed albums and then I feel like the Beatles like you said they're trying out country rock you know um, at different spots they're trying out you know uh, words of love sounds like a like Buddy Holly song, uh, you know, it is a Buddy Holly song. I was going to say, and, and that's, it's, I was going to ask you if it was, <laughs> yes, um, it is. so there you go. So it, it sounds like a Buddy Holly song. Kansas city. Hey, Hey, Hey is, is them trying to do country, right? Um, no well, reply. Uh, no, I, that's, well, that's a blues song. That's like, li- that's a little Richard cover and that's Paul McCartney trying his best to be little Richard. Yeah. You but it, it just, it screams country to me though. You know what I mean? The way that like blues can morph into country. And I don't know what I, I to me, seems straight up blues to me. I mean, it's got it's a very basic blues riff, but there is there are similarities. So well, it, I, I, hot take here. I, I think that John Lennon was always the better blues singer in the Beatles, and so when John Lennon sings blues, like to me, it, it it's authentic. But to me, you know, uh, McCartney's not even like blue eyed soul. I'd say he's his own thing, and he's a wonderful singer and composer. But I think that's part of what I might be hearing that it's just. You know, it just isn't the same to me as listening to blues. I, I, it's just, I don't know, man. I, I love McCartney's vo- vocals on that. And vo- McCartney doesn't have many vocals on here. You know, um, it's interesting because I was reading through and a lot of the stuff that I'm, I'm seeing is talking about how this is a very Lennon heavy album. And I think that's mainly because Lennon takes the lead vocals on most of the songs. Um, George takes one. Ringo takes one. Paul's got a couple. Um, but. I think Paul McCartney's performance of the Kansas City Hey 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 is fantastic, you know. And he he did mention that he, he, I think the quote was it took a great deal of nerve just to ju- to jump up and scream like an idiot. Um, and all the meanwhile, I guess Lennon was in the background egging him on, like, "Come on, you can do it better than that. Do another take. Come on, man, throw it this time," you know. Um, but I don't. I think I, I love McCartney's voice on this, and I think that it shows a real. It, it's part of the range of McCartney, right? Because McCartney can do the most. You know, um, the, you know, the quiet, like almost like a lullaby, very beautiful, melodic kind of, um, you know, crooning almost. And then he can just belt out something like this or Helter Skelter. And, uh, you know, maybe you like Lennon doing that better. And I get that. But I, I wouldn't I, I don't um, you know, I, I, I don't think that McCartney's fallen short here at all. With that That's OK. We can agree to disagree. I, I wouldn't say you, you won me over on that, but it's a fair assessment. I just. I, I, but I know your your passion for the Beatles, and so like I I do see how it scratches the itch for you. Up, uh, Josh, though, I mean, you could be our tiebreaker. You know who's wrong, Matt or I? Mm. Let's call it a tie. Okay, let's call it a tie. <laughs> <laughs> Josh is indifferent. I, I really didn't like that Mr. Moonlight song either. I thought I didn't either, and song. I know John Lennon references it constantly as his favorite song and anything I've ever seen, and I can never understand why. Well, I didn't. I didn't see that. What I did see was that this was described. This has been described by critics and other fans as "quote the weakest track the Beatles ever recorded" and the song that everyone loves to hate. 
Um, which, you know, I don't know if I call it the weakest track ever, but it's definitely not a, not a song I'd enjoyed at all. I've heard it be, I'm fine with it. I mean, I get why people don't like it. I, I, there's other, I'd probably rather listen to that than something like the long and winding road or something like that, which is probably, that's one of my least favorite Beatles songs. But, um, I would also say every little thing is like a, a song that doesn't make almost any other Beatles album. It just was very, there was a weird gong percussion type sound to it's it the that timpani, I, john that's yeah the i just i know i just i i figured it was but it, it i purposely called it a gong sound because with the timpani the timpani can be played delicately you know as well and this just sounded like the gong show you know what i mean and just it didn't <laughs> do anything for me yeah. i'm a loser like i get why people like it and i know why it's historically important because you know lennon is beginning to take on some of his lyrical themes and you know, like the quote you said earlier, right? You know, what are you talking about? And that's, you know, Lennon kind of go in there. It was his but, quote, what he called, he's starting his Dylan period. That's basically yeah, Dylan, and, him trying to be Dylan, which carried and, over and, to help. And, and, and I was going to... Rubber Soul. Well, and, and I would agree, but man, as someone who loves Help and Rubber Soul, I feel like it was a necessary... It was a necessary thing to do to get ready for those albums, but it definitely sounded like training wheels here because it was sort of like, yeah. uh, if I wanted to listen to this, I'd, I'd listen to Bob Dylan. Yeah, this is definitely a band in transition, right? You can yes. see all the, all the ways that they're going to grow in the future, but it's still, a, you know, you don't have, just because you're trying stuff out doesn't mean you need to put it on wax. <laughs> um. No, no, not true. And actually, and what I found um, interesting was the song, I'll Follow the Sun, which was a McCartney song. He, that was, he actually wrote that eight years prior when he was 16. Wow, and that's pretty sure. remarkable because that's actually one of the songs I like best on the album. Well, and Yeah, it, I like that song too. And it shows you, I mean, it was something that he had thought of recording, but they never really did because he, they felt that it didn't go well with the, their earlier image that they were going for, the more the rocking R and B image that they were, that they were going for. But it speaks to the fact that they kind of had a dearth of material, you know, that they, because they were doing so much touring, they weren't mm-hmm. writing as much and they just needed something to put on there. So they were like, all right, let's go to the, what do we have on the, you know, in the, in the back room. And then they put I'll follow sun on, which, you know, is, is a great song. And it's all, it's one of the other songs that McCartney actually sings. Um, there's a couple of songs in here that that you know normally if you hear a Beatle singing a song they are g- generally the principal songwriter, but there's mm-hmm. a couple of sa- uh, cases on here where that's not true and one of them was Eight Days a Week, which mm-hmm. I, I couldn't really see if McCartney was definitely the principal songwriter, but it was his original idea, and you know it started with him and he was in a, a cab with or no yeah chauffeur mentioned had used that term you know I, I'm just working eight days a week. And uh, he really liked that and, you know, and started writing the song to it. But Lennon takes the lead on that. Um, and the other, the other thing um, that, you know, that, what was the other song that they did that with? Um, it was What You're Doing. Um, wait, no, no, it wasn't that. What was it? Shoot. I had it here a second ago. But there was another one that, um, that he did that with, that, that Lennon took the leads that wasn't really his song. It was maybe his Every, every Little Thing. That's that was going to be my yeah, guess. Yeah, that was that one. So that was the main McCartney song that Lennon sang. So I couldn't figure out why that was the case, but um, they just felt maybe Lennon was going to be better on that. But um, I, I think for me, there's two standout tracks on here that are kind of like deep cuts. And that's I don't want to spoil the party, which is that is what has been called their most overt attempt at country music. And um, I really like Babies in Black. I mean, that's just a great bluesy waltz kind of thing. tune. Um, very catchy. And something that doesn't really appear on, you know, their best of lists. But I think that those are two very strong songs. And of course, Eight Days a Week, which was their seventh number one single. And also (laughs) their seventh number one single in that same year. They had their first seven singles were all in the same year, 1964. So, yeah, I. That's a lot of hits. It is. Um, So. I mean, I, I, I love, I pretty much, I love every Beatles album, right? So I'm not going to say a whole lot about, I, I do feel like that I see where this is a transition. It's certainly not as good as, you know, it's the albums that came after this, but I do, I, I think it's better than um, their, the maybe you know, their sec their second album with the Beatles and maybe even their first one. Um, I, I do like that. It's a little bit more introspective. I like that. It's a little darker. It's more interesting. I mean, the timpani, John, you're kind of knocking that, but that's where they're starting to experiment with different, you know, uh, instrumentation so but you're right and josh yeah just because you're trying something different doesn't mean you have to record it but 
I don't mind it. I think it's, uh, you know, I, of course, but I've been listening to this album for forever. And um, like I said, there's not much that I'm going to say, you know, bad about it. Um, so. I will say the Beatles, I, I, I like the earlier Beatles albums earlier because as I've said before, the Beatles are a really excellent R&B cover band and rock and roll music is an excellent R&B cover. Yeah, it is, um, isn't it? I, I do feel though that once again, I feel obligated to say, if you enjoy it, go check out the Chuck Berry version, which is also awesome. <laughs> so it's just, it's well worth looking into. And that's what, what covers can be sometimes. It's like a great gateway into previous music. And uh, that, you know, that song, that sound said sounded like a Buddy Holly song. Check out Buddy Holly too, because he's pretty damn good. Speaking of the Buddy Holly song, did you notice the jangle guitar, John? I did notice it a little bit. Yeah, it wasn't like birds bit. jangle. It's, it's, right, it's yeah. in your face. It's, that's all it is, is the beginning yeah. of the jangle guitar. It's, it's the it, it's, that's what I feel the like words. the Beatles sometimes get credit for like all of this stuff. And it's like, yeah, but you know, it's like, oh, the Beatles discovered country. Oh, the Beatles, you know, discovered. And, you know, I'll give them feedback because they did, you know, put that on there. And they were one of the first to put that on albums. But sometimes I feel, you know, the Beatles, the Beatles are so good as a group, they don't need people searching for extra things to give them any more added genius. You know what I mean? And I feel like that's sometimes what people do with the Beatles. Well, that wasn't it's, me. That that came, that comes from yeah. Roger McGuinn because he's the he's the reason he was playing that. George Harrison's the reason he was playing the Rickenbacker. Well, so. if uh, uh, well, I'll tell you one thing. If if uh, Roger McGuinn says the Beatles are who got him to play jangle guitar, and since he's the influence of all the jangle guitar players that I love, then you know what? Kudos to George, who already is my favorite Beatle even more so. And, and I will say something else. I always surprisingly like the Ringo star songs on every <laughs> Beatles album more than I probably should. And, <laughs> and this is no different. Like I, they're, they're never the best song or even in the top three best songs, but I always find them to be way more enjoyable. And they, they show up at different parts of every Beatles album, which is kind of funny. Like, you know, it can be the first track or it can be a deep cut or it just randomly shows up at track number six. And I always am amused when the Ringo song comes. So, oh, there's a good I point like, about that. I, oh, go ahead, Josh. I was going to say, I like when he calls out George to play the guitar. I always like when bands do that in a song. <laughs> Rock on, George. Hey, that's, a, that's another, uh, that's a slight cleaning the stack that I'm going to do right now. I read, John, that uh, are you, how familiar are you with the monkey song, No Time? Uh, very. That's and so do you, then that's apparently they yell that out at one point. Rock on, George for one, Ringo one time in that song, Dirk DeForest solo. There you go. So, well, uh, <laughs> as you know, the monkeys were created to basically ape the Beatles and then became their own thing. So that makes total sense. But I agree with that. I, I Ringo is Ringo is always kind of like a nice little breath of fresh air to some extent because he's just this lovable goof goofy guy that was just very kind of happy go lucky and he's got this really unique voice that it's just. Uh, and, and it, I think they always did a good job with picking the song for him to sing. Mm -hmm. I read that initially that when they did this song, it was sung by John, which just would have seemed so different, you know, to mm -hmm. me. <laughs> um, but uh, but I, yeah, I think that the Ringo songs are always they're, they're always fun to, to listen to on the album. And they and he's a much better keep the time drummer than he gets credit for, too. And, and I yeah. use that, uh, you know, keeping the time as a drummer is a certain type of drummer. And while it's not the sexiest way to drum, uh, it's what the Beatles needed and he does a good job at it. And so I do want to kind of throw that out there that uh, I think sometimes, I think in, in er, uh, later years, he's sort of come to be appreciated as a good keep the time drummer, but I'll throw my plug in there. Ringo, yeah. good keep the time drummer. Well, and he, he certainly had his challenges ahead of him, particularly when they played live and they couldn't hear each other. And he was, you know, so especially all of them, they're just trying to, trying to do their best to keep up with each other. But, um, yeah, so it's it's I agree it's 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 certainly not their one of their strongest albums. It's probably on the weaker side of things. Um, I, I like it. There's not really I can see why you know Mr. Moonlight doesn't bother me that much as it does other people. But yeah, it is a weaker song on this record. But um, I think there's some gems in here. Uh, I it's and again it's for a Beatles album. It's it's you know it's what 32, 33 minutes something like that. So with a lot of these albums that we're talking about, they're pretty short. Um, uh, so I, I'm going to, I'm never giving a thumbs down to a Beatles record, but, um, but if you wanted better records, there's certainly more to come. Come back for our bonus episode where we rank all the Beatles songs. Oh, that's a good idea. All the Beatles songs. <laughs> Holy crap. That's, that's going to be, that's going to be singer. a, that's going to be a cleaning the attic with the other two members of the group, not myself. So yeah, feel that's free. Like Enjoy a, that's that. That's like a meta Sophie's choice right there. <laughs> 
Yeah. <laughs> That's our new podcast, Cleaning the Beatles. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you'll meet you'll meet the Beatles while you're with the Beatles, and at the end you'll be screaming help. How's that? <laughs> so, Selling yeah. the Beatles. Yeah. yeah. Nice. So and I was drinking uh, out of a Beatles cup, so that's how much of a Beatles. I was, fan yes, he I is. got my revolver Beatles glass. I don't have a uh, I don't have a uh, Beatles for sale glass, so I have to do revolver. Not, not yet. Uh, there's some great irony to that, isn't there, that Matt doesn't have a piece of merch when we talk about Beatles for sale. So uh, it's right. pretty good. 